Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome, a very warm welcome actually to all our speakers, panelists and attendees. And welcome to the second edition uh, of our corporate governance seminars. And today's topic will be focusing on ethics, inshallah. So those of you that attended our first uh, webinar, we had Brother Suleiman Badat, who presented quite um, uh, comprehensively on the essence and content of best practices uh, in governing uh, our Islamic NPOs. Uh, and, and I think that all those uh, issues that we discuss are generally applicable to all NPOs, uh, irrespective of religious background. So hopefully uh, today's uh, session, inshallah, will be focusing on um, a, a, it's actually a deep dive, as we may call it, into certain specific aspects of corporate governance. And this one here would be looking at ethics. So uh, in terms of the program, we have two main speakers, uh, Brother Muhammad Muhammadi, and I think um, many of you are familiar with him. Uh, he has been on our last uh, corporate governance uh, webinar. Uh, he is a chartered accountant and also uh, past or former CEO and CFO of one of the our largest trans uh, largest state-owned enterprises, Transnet. And those of you from South Africa know uh, that this is uh, this has been the subject of um, corruption and uh, state capture and so forth. So we hope that uh, you know we, we get some uh, interesting insights from Mohammed Mohammadi. And then the second speaker is Mahmoud Asatay, Mahmoud Asatay professor, who is from Durham University. He's well, uh, well versed in matters of Islamic economics and finance. Uh, he has been on many, many webinars and seminars, uh, you know, and he's also uh, Recently, I heard him on uh, talking on Zakar, actually. So I think we've got uh, quite a quite a, quite an esteemed uh, guest there. Then, of course, we also have two panelists, uh, Sister Sadia Adam, who's a senior manager at IRBA, uh, and and she's also a technical advisor at the International Ethics Standards Board for Accountants. Uh, of course, we have uh, Shabir Chan, well known. As, uh, CEO of uh, Al Baraka Bank here in South Africa, and he's also the chairman of the Association of Muslim Accountants and Lawyers. So I'm not going to spend much more time on this uh, topic. I think um, we, we're going to listen to our speakers. Uh, Mohammed Mohammadi will, will first of all talk to us about building an ethical culture in our organization. So over to you, Brother Mohammed. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Zainul Jazakumullah khair. I hope you can hear me. And I hope all the participants can hear us. I think the purpose for today is actually to give you a sense, uh, the participants a sense of, um, you know, how to actually get to build an ethical organization. We talk about ethics, but how to actually build an ethical organization. And uh, we want to get the mind activated to consider the various uh, scenarios and dilemmas that uh, people face in the NPO space on a daily basis. Um, you know, we always say that we're doing the right things, but are we doing the right things in our NPOs on a regular basis and a repetitive basis? We also need to think about what are the things we need to change as NPOs, particularly, uh, you know, when we are public funded organizations so we, we hope that we can provide you with some guidance in terms of how this can be achieved. Uh, but I want to just get the juices flowing in the head basically across the board and we're gonna share with you a little video uh, that talks about some of the ethical dilemmas that uh, you know, not just organizations but uh, people face in general uh, locally and globally. So we'll share this video with you. Imagine you're watching a runaway trolley barreling down the tracks, straight towards five workers who can't escape. 
you happen to be standing next to a switch that will divert the trolley onto a second track. Here's the problem. That track has a worker on it too, but just one. What do you do? Do you sacrifice one person to save five? This is the trolley problem, a version of an ethical dilemma that philosopher Philippa Foote devised in 1967. It's popular because it forces us to think about how to choose when there are no good choices. Do we pick the action with the best outcome or stick to a moral code that prohibits causing someone's death? In one survey, about 90% of respondents said that it's okay to flip the switch, letting one worker die to save five. And other studies, including a virtual reality simulation of the dilemma, have found similar results. These judgments are consistent with the philosophical principle of utilitarianism, which argues that the morally correct decision is the one that maximizes well-being for the greatest number of people. The five lives outweigh one, even if achieving that outcome requires condemning someone to death. But people don't always take the utilitarian view, which we can see by changing the trolley problem a bit. This time, you're standing on a bridge over the track as the runaway trolley approaches. Now there's no second track, but there is a very large man on the bridge next to you. If you push him over, his body will stop the trolley, saving the five workers, but he'll die. To utilitarians, the decision is exactly the same. Lose one life to save five. But in this case, only about 10% of people say that it's okay to throw the man onto the tracks. Our instincts tell us that deliberately causing someone's death is different than allowing them to die as collateral damage. It just feels wrong for reasons that are hard to explain. This intersection between ethics and psychology is what's so interesting about the trolley problem. The dilemma and its many variations reveal that what we think is right or wrong depends on factors other than a logical weighing of the pros and cons. Our discussions at the last um, session that we had touching on ethics, and we touched on ethics from both a, what we would call a traditional Sharia perspective, as well as um, we spoke about ethics from a uh, Islamic perspective. And the Quran has, you know, very clearly enunciated the principles of ethics and ethical standards. Uh, the Sunnah in the life of Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he has on many, many occasions illustrated to us what um, the standards should be from an integrity, honesty, and uh, fairness perspective, which are amongst the key principles in terms of, um, you know, what, what the Western world or the traditional world defines ethics as. I want to just narrate one story which is absolutely, um, I think, uh, relevant to nonprofit organizations particularly. This is the uh, example in the time of uh, the Khalif Amir al muminin Umar bin Abdul Aziz. Uh, he arrives home one evening, it's the eve of the Eid, and uh, his wife Fatima bint Abdul Malik, who by uh, all standards is of exemplary uh, lineage, uh, her parents and, and grand her father and grandfathers were uh, uh, Khalifs at the time. And he is uh, you know, confronted by her and she says that uh, when we look at the life of, uh, we look at our children, our children have got no clothes, absolutely nothing to wear for Eid tomorrow that is, um, that is decent. And, uh, and he says, but all of the money that I have uh, is in front of you and we can't afford anything. She suggests that he visit the Baitul Mal and ask the treasurer to provide uh, some uh, advance on his salary. And this is what we really need to uh, uh, focus on. The treasurer then asks him um, that if, I, if you can give me one guarantee, then I will gladly make this advance available to you. And the guarantee that I want is that you will have uh, life for a month, for the month to come. Uh, then I will gladly provide you with this uh, one month salary advance. Uh, so this is something, that's the Baitul Mal. And I uh, also, you know, this is something that we have to ponder on as 
uh, as non-profit organizations. Uh, some of the key constituents of uh, ethics, we've spoken previously about leadership. We've touched on the system of repetitive behaviors. That means doing the right thing every time, not once, not twice, not when it suits us, but every time. Having the appropriate moral compass. It's the principle of fairness. And I think one of the fundamental issues is acting in the best interest of the nonprofit organization. Now, when we talk about the principle of fairness, there's also this dilemma about legal versus ethical. Um, you know, whether it's legally permitted and still deemed to be ethical and acceptable. I give an example here, uh, which is the example of John Thane, the CEO of Merrill Lynch in 2008, legally permitted to actually um, go ahead and refurbish his offices. Yet he spent just over, I think it was 1 million US dollars. Um, and in that spending of 1 million US dollars, at that time, Merrill Lynch was projecting a loss of in the region of $270 million. So when we talk about ethical, legal, so sometimes something is legally acceptable or legally permitted, but ethically, it actually brings a very different discussion to the table. Um, you know, one of the issues that constantly comes up is the issue of transparency. We've had this discussion as well in the um, last uh, uh, in the last conversation, uh, how much is enough of information? Uh, what should we be talking to in terms of uh, information to our stakeholders? Uh, what mediums should we be using? My perspective is very simple, that the more transparent an NPO is perceived to be, the better for that NPO. Now, why do I say perceived to be? It's a very simple discussion because transparency is perception. It's decided by the public in terms of where they may uh, agree that a, uh, an NPO is being transparent. This is quite important because it goes to the ethical values of a nonprofit organization when we talk about transparency. Um, donor communication. Uh, we believe, in my view, that an NPO must have a proper communication strategy. Otherwise, uh, you are all over the place. You know, you, you one day decide Facebook is your social media platform and the, the next day it's Instagram and then one day it's uh, emails. You've got to have a proper communication strategy to talk to your donors about what is happening in your organization, particularly when it comes to specific initiatives that you run, where you go out to the, to the donor base and you say, that you're looking for money for a particular project, you need to make sure that you keep your donors appraised of how that money is being spent. Now, when we actually go back and look at why is there need for ethics? Why is there need for an ethical organization? Why is there need for us to spend uh, this amount of time on building an ethical organization? The one big challenge we have, and this is not my studies, these are not studies that um, you know, we've gone and handpicked. The Association of Fraud Examiners is an institute that is based in the United States, but has um, a fairly significant uh, reach across the uh, globe. Uh, they have provided you know, some context. This is the 2020 report. You can very easily uh, pull this off the web and, and read it, it's quite an extensive report and it's um, actually quite an interesting report. Uh, this overall insights talks to uh, institutions, uh, businesses across the sectors, whether it be private, public, uh, whether it be NPOs, et cetera. But what they're saying is that organizations generally, you'd find that they suffer losses of approximately 5% of their revenue. Uh, that is a very, very significant number. Um, $3.6 billion was lost in 2020 in their report as they, as they currently report. Corruption was common every single area that they reviewed, be it in America or be it in, in, the, in, in South Africa or in Australia. Corruption was at the center of many schemes. 43% of the schemes uh, that were reported or identified were detected by tip-offs. 
50% of those tip-offs were coming from employees. But here's uh, quite an interesting one. 55% of the fraud executed was by owners, managers, and executives, and only 41% by employees. Um, and in small businesses, the most likely places where corruption, fraud, theft occurred, it was in invoicing, billing, in the payroll environment, and in checks. Now, they have specific reviews that have been done when it comes to nonprofit organizations. So what you're seeing here in front of you now is a specific reviews around nonprofit organizations. 191 cases that were reviewed, the average loss per case was 639,000 US dollars. That's $639,000 per case, that's the average. The key areas of fraud and manipulation in nonprofit organizations, I want to stress that. Corruption, billing, expense claims, cash on hand, and skimming. We'll touch on some of these as we go through um, the next few minutes, inshallah. What is astounding is that if you compare to the private sector, where 55% of the losses were by owners, managers, and executives, in the NPO space, 74% of the fraud was executed and manipulated by owners, managers, and executives. And the question that comes up is why? And that is because their review says that nonprofit organizations are generally more susceptible to fraud and error because they have less resources, less oversight, and the lack of internal controls. And then they go further to say, well, what are the three top control weaknesses in nonprofit organizations? Again, I just want to stress this is nonprofit organizations. Lack of internal controls, lack of management review, and an override of existing controls. And this override is by people in positions of power who override employees or volunteers in an NPO to execute some sort of fraud or theft or some sort of manipulation. When we look at um, you know, what has happened globally in the last 20, 30 years, uh, you know, we, we tend to be very focused on certain specifics. Someone you talk to will talk about one incident that occurred somewhere, or today everybody wants to talk about the COVID uh, challenges that we experience with theft and fraud and the allegations that are currently leveled against uh, the government and many entities. But we tend to forget that you know, we have these kind of uh, corruption schemes that have been going back many years, but recently we've, be, we've seen um, at the center of all of these schemes is a poor ethical standard. Whether we talk about Enron or we talk about Ponzi schemes like the Bernie Madoff scheme, Tonga Hewlett, which recently lost a multi-billion rand, Steinoff in South Africa, and also we talk about the state capture program in South Africa, which has um, lost South Africa many, many billions of, of rents. Uh, so I think it's necessary that we as NPOs need to be aware. We need to be very focused that these things do happen, not just in the uh, private sector or the public sector. We tend to have this view that, you know, we all have a perspective on what's happening in the government circles. But sometimes we need to take an introspective uh, perspective to understand what's happening in our own organizations. Now, if we want to develop a, a reasonably good ethical organization, it's not something that we're just going to speak about. It's not something that you're just going to have a very good dream about. Because in my view, a dream without a plan is what I call a hallucination. Nothing's going to happen if we don't have a proper plan in place. Um, and this plan has to be very, very focused. Uh, so the suggestion that we have is, you know, if we look at four of the key pillars, we talk about having a proper strategy, a strategy that is well documented, a strategy that has the buy-in of the board and all trustees, all senior executives who believe in that. And one of the things that we have to put out there is walking the talk, not just talking the talk. A lot of people have got very good ideas and they are able to expound them brilliantly. But actually, when it comes to what their actions say, 
their actions fundamentally differ and are at odds with what they actually say. We need to have proper codes and policies, Pol policies that govern the NPO that avoid confusion later on. I, I touch on uh, travel policy, for example. In many NPOs, we are faced with uh, claims later on that the person stayed at a five-star hotel when they, the NPO was expecting the person to stay at a, at a four-star or a three-star uh, accommodation. And, and those things are not documented, yet they do not necessarily require you to have pages and reams of policies. But it means that you need to have, even if it be a page that suggests this is what the policies are, that will govern a particular transaction or process. We must have a proper implementation roadmap. And that roadmap or that implementation program must be owned at an executive level. There's got to be monitoring and oversight. This is something that in any report that you read, regardless of where you are, in which perspective, monitoring and oversight or the lack thereof leads to unethical organizations. Why? It's because people know that nobody's reviewing uh, reviewing statements, reviewing documents, reviewing payments, reviewing receipts. If they know that that's not happening, then unfortunately temptation sets in and temptation then creates the opportunity for fraud and for error. Now, when we look at it and we talk about some of the practical examples of dilemmas that people will face, um, you know, one of the ones is actually the misuse of organizations' time. Here I refer to two different examples. One is the example of where we very uh, often reference and we say, well, you know, we're paying a person a salary and that particular individual is now, as an example, that person is using his time to do something else. And this is where the NPO pays his salary. I want to throw some uh, another very different perspective to this, where we've experienced where people actually are paid by uh, third party companies and are volunteers in an NPO. Um, that's also the abuse of uh, an organization's time. That's the organization that's paying you. Uh, they didn't anticipate that you'll do uh, work uh, outside of your mandate uh, where, from where you earn a salary, no matter how good that work is you should not be abusing that privilege. Um, we touch on, you know, a common dilemma is a conflict of interest. Conflicts of interest, we've researched. This is not now my perspective and, and, and some, uh, you know, thumbs up. This is research shows that 20% of goods and services in NPOs are procured from an entity that's owned by a board member. You know, the question of pricing, the question of payment terms, the question of special privileges, these are things that, does your organization have a conflict of interest declaration process? Is it recorded? Are, your, are all of the owners or the, uh, the, the executives, do they actually go out and say, you know, we, we have that interest in that business and, and there should be more clarity and, and there should be a lot more uh, care taken when we're dealing with those ent entities. Another significant one is around compensation. Um, you know, firstly, it starts right at the beginning, the process of recruitment. How are people recruited? Are we recruiting the best people, particularly if we are paying them? If they are paid employees, then we need to hire the best people, not friends, not family, not relatives of relatives, etc. Uh, disclosure of salaries of key executives and board of directors. This is something that's absolutely key. We don't see it too much in our organizations, but uh, it's something that we should be driving towards. We should be very clear about the salaries of executives. How much money is being spent on administration? Uh, you know, so because we talk about Lilla and Zaka and all of that, of that money, how much is being spent uh, in providing salaries to a variety of people in the organization? Um, disclosure of the perks, etc. These are some of the things that we need to touch on. I think here what you would see is that we talk about the individual being at the heart of an ethical organization. We can have the best strategies, we can have the best policies, we can have the best stake, uh, you know, stakeholder engagement plans, et cetera, but the individual is what drives ethics. The person, the individual at the center of his heart and is at the center of this organization 
you got to employ individuals who are honest, who have an honesty, integrity, and, and fairness at their very soul. Their DNA uh, is, is part, that's their DNA. One of the key things that we find is that uh, if you look at it, you know, the criticality of the individual that we talk about, an individual is not just himself, uh, one part of him. Now we, we touch here on a number of things. You look at that we talk about the IQ and EQ. Um, you know, it's the holistic personality. And EQ today is becoming more important than IQ. In the 90s, they spoke about, or in the 70s, they spoke about IQ. In the 90s to 2000s, they spoke about EQ. Today, they talk about SQ and PQ. And then that's spiritual quotient and, and physical quotient. And today, we're talking about adaptability quotient, AQ. Why? Because the AQ is around how we can adapt, particularly in this time of a pandemic. So this is essentially the last slide anyway. I think, you know, we say there's no I in team. Um, that's absolutely untrue, because if the I is not straight, then you actually don't have a straight team. Um, when we talk about EQ, EQ talks about self-awareness. Um, why is that absolutely critical? It's because if an individual doesn't have the self-awareness, uh, doesn't reflect, doesn't introspect as to what he's doing right or wrong, whether it's within some, um, you know, if he's operating within some perverse agenda and, and doesn't have this perspective of understanding his social awareness and his relationships from an EQ perspective, then you have a problem. That individual is actually going to create more challenges for you within your organization than, than actual solutions. So I think that's really uh, some of the, uh, Zeno, that's some of the key aspects that we put on the table in terms of what are the pillars to creating an ethical organization? Okay, Jazakallah Khairan for that. I think uh, you've given really some wonderful insights there. Uh, one of the things I think that we, we need to focus on also is uh, the relationships between uh, the various stakeholders in, in an organization from donors to beneficiaries to trustees one of the points that you raised there was about salaries of directors. Uh, and I've just come across the uh, an international standard on you know, non-governmental organizations, which actually uh, emphatically state that uh, trustees and directors of organizations should not be salaried. They should be volunteer people. Uh, staff should be salaried, but not trustees and uh, directors of boards or boards of directors. But Jazakallah for that. Uh, let's go on to our next speaker, Professor, Professor uh, Mahmoud uh, Asute, who's from Durham University. And he'll be talking to us about um, the, the articulation of an ethical culture in organizations. Jazakallah, over to you, Professor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you for Mr. Mohammed for setting the scenario, but of course in a practical manner. Um, I will be taking you through perhaps more on a philosophical side to 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 constitute the ground um, for the ethical understanding. While ethics is an important aspect of our life, including in governance, uh, but there are different ways of articulating ethics. As uh, mentioned by Mr. Mohammadi, the common ethics that we have around us is very much the utilitarian ethics, which is of course shaping us, unfortunately, in a particular manner. However, um, within the plurality of understanding as well as the governance in relation to governance as well, uh, but mostly the plurality of philosophies uh, and the way we articulate, um, Islamic ethics has a particular position in relation to governance as well as the everyday life. And therefore, um, although I'm not going to be able to give you a practical hint how Islamic ethics can be um, can be implemented, but I'm hoping that um, some of the um, um, some of the um, issues I'm going to raise it will give us certain understanding how we can move into the next stage of bringing this out. Um, and therefore, um, the, the whole um, idea of um, corporate governance versus the Islamic governance, um, many of us perhaps uh, would consider that, look, corporate governance in itself is something good, so why do we need to establish a different ways of looking at governance? Um, and that is very much related with how we understand the world around us. Um, 
because corporate governance that we discuss, which shapes us, uh, which shapes our everyday life as well as our organization, including NPOs around us, is very much the product of a particular worldview. And that worldview um, very much essentialized around accumulation. Um, and that accumulation is very much what neoliberalism has been uh, forcing the entire world to go forward. So it is a particular social formation. And that social formation is very much articulated with the um, the science of economics, because when we look at science of economics, it refers to efficiency and maximization. The human is not there. The other stakeholders are not there. As long as we optimize, as long as we achieve efficiency and maximization, maximizing our profits and utilities, um, that's the end of the story. Um, and therefore, the neoliberalism is considered the end of the history. However, um, there are different positions, therefore, to understand that, and um, which requires, uh, which the, the, the world in which we require, requires a certain touch of justice, as the injustices, as we have seen with the COVID as well around us, but also in, in countries in, um, in all over the world, to be honest, not only in developing countries, we have seen how injustices are articulated. We have seen with COVID how um, very large economies, very powerful, and they have amazing war machines uh, to kill people in a, in a press of a button, but they could not provide um, face masks, for instance, for their um, health sector workers. And therefore it, it shows that there's a particular need uh, to articulate um, the stakeholders' interests. And therefore, the, um, when we look at the Islam, uh, Islamic position, Islam directly refers to virtue ethics. And that is very much related with the whole definition of iqtisad, although it is translated economics, but the whole content of iqtisad directly refers to justice, equity, and equilibrium establishing. And in particular, when we are talking about zakat and waqf institutions, um, this, this becomes particularly an issue, of course, in everyday life, but in particular, these institutions are the organic institutions emerge with Islamic ontology. And therefore, the Islamic governance that we are referring has a particular ethical position, and that ethical position directly produces what we call the Ihsani governance. Ihsani in the sense that establishing equilibrium between different stakeholders, ensuring that everyone's interest is served without harming anyone else. And therefore that Ihsani governance uh, directing things towards equilibrium and establishing justice between different stakeholders is the ethical basis of, of Islamic governance. And this is because the Islamic social formation directly developed through the Islamic ontology um, um, directly suggests a particularly a sharing economy as opposed to accumulation. And therefore zakat and waqf institutions emerged organically because they, um, they were not transplanted, such as banks. Banks have been transplanted uh, from capitalist economies into the rest of the world. However, Zakat and Waqf directly emerged um, entirely with the e emergence of Islam. And therefore that directly suggests a particular social formation and that is the sharing economy as opposed to accumulation, because corporate governance as an idea emerged when the accumulation of capital um, came out as a result of um, um, uh, as a result of the Western um, social formation, and therefore um, Islamic governance, um, rather than corporate governance, Islamic governance uh, relates to well-being and welfare of all the stakeholders involved and around us. Uh, because um, according to Islamic ontology, whatever we have around us is a privilege. And therefore, within that privilege, the ihsan, uh, equilibrium, establishing equilibrium between different stakeholders is a must, um, rather than as an option. Because unlike the corporate governance that we have around us, traditional or conventional, whatever we'll call, uh, we'll call it, um, the corporate governance that we have around us, it directly relates that everything is a right. So when it is a right, unfortunately, then it becomes, um, rather than being a privilege, when it is a right, then you have the right to maximize. You have the right to um, create efficiency at the expense of other stakeholders. And that has unfortunately shaped the political economy of the, um, uh, of the world uh, for the last uh, few hundred years. And therefore that distinction, the virtue ethics of um, Islam and, and Islamic moral economy is particularly important. Of course, in that um, what we face in our everyday life, the 
the substantive morality as opposed to instrumental morality of Islam. Because in everyday uh, lives, uh, we see this dilemma, uh, and this is an important dilemma for us, uh, such as donating for as, um, zakat, um, because for most of the people, um, they would consider zakat as a donation. So that's very much an instrumental morality because that, that is out of my charitable giving, um, and we would consider that as an Islamic quality. However, zakat is, is not a charitable giving because the substantive morality suggests that zakat is not yours. It is the right of society that has to be delivered and given back to society. Why? Again, part of that privileges, um, according to Islamic ontology, everything given to individuals, even if they are in private businesses, running private businesses, the resources created by Allah. And therefore, even it is within your business, you are using those resources, it is at the end of the day, the right of the society is there because Allah created. In other words, not only the use value of things, but inherited value because of the creation. And therefore that substantive morality directly suggests that zakat has to be returned. The right of the society has to, has to be returned to society. So rather than an instrumental morality, lest we have the organization, uh, let's do whatever we do, we maximize, uh, we, we go according to efficiency because it is right. And then whatever profit we generated, let's give some of them as a charity. No, they, that has to be substantively recognized, has to be substantively recognized uh, from the beginning. And therefore the um, sharing economy nature. And unfortunately, um, therefore how fuck, um, the Islamic law has unfortunately instrumentalized morality um, and the way it has defined, unfortunately, rather than Islamic substantive morality in shaping our organization as well as in um, our everyday uh, life. And therefore, within this um, uh, virtue ethics of Islam, um, the whole idea of the complementarity, everything created by Allah, therefore everything complements each other to produce a unitarity in the end. Um, so therefore, there is no hegemonic relationship, but everything is horizontally complementing each other um, because justice has to be established. Why? Because everything created by Allah and there is no uh, hegemonic relationship. And that is essentially uh, tells us what is the um, objective function here, um, that we have to direct everything towards the perfection that Allah created the way Allah created, the fitra, the whole fitra idea. So therefore it is the responsibility of, such as in our case, the organizations in terms of governance um, to provide the opportunity spaces uh, for everything, to environment, to labor, uh, to land, to all the stakeholders so that they can reach their perfection. Um, because our objective with the task here, yes, growth, everyone and everything has a right to grow but that growth has to be in harmony without harming others. And that, why? Because we have to establish equilibrium in the society. The outcome of that, as mentioned, individual is at the heart of it because at the end of the day, not organizations, but individuals are responsible to charge that duty, discharge that duty. And therefore we talked about the fallah, the, the individual sal um, rich salvation, an individual who rich salvation consider um, um, fallah individual. And that individual has embedded in his or her life, such qualities establishing equilibrium in the society. Therefore, the ifsane or equilibrium oriented, um, beneficence oriented governance is an essential part of um, Islamic, uh, Islamic governance. And that is essentially important when we are talking about zakat related institutions and work related institutions as NPOs, um, such qualities. And therefore we have to be very careful that on the one hand, of course, regulative environment require certain corporate governance qualities, but in addition to that in-house, Islamic um, governance as an ethicality has to be developed to be able to run these institutions as expected. Because at the end of the day, uh, what we would expect from these institutions to deliver according to what we call Makasr al-Sharia, the objective of Sharia. And the objective of Sharia is interpreted as well-being, well-being of human, well-being all other stakeholders. Uh, so therefore our organizations, whatever the organizations we have, including NPOs, have that duty to discharge what is the human as well as the other stakeholders' well-being and welfare. And therefore, because the value system directly at the top determines um, what our objective function is, the Islamic ontology and epistemology, um, through the tafid, um, a 
establishing that complementarity between different stakeholders determines us the values, those values through the norms, uh, such as the uh, perfection, reaching to perfection, as well as the, uh, the harmony in growth determines our norms and that determines the roles in our institutions and that uh, produces us uh, at the end. What we would expect as an outcome is the realization of Makasla Sharia or um, that is the um, human human well-being as well as the well-being all, of all the stakeholders. And that is very much the emancipatory and empowerment. Okay, On the one hand, Islam through this a sunny governance aims at emancipating individuals uh, emancipate and then empowering them. On the one hand, need from the needs, emancipation from the needs, and then empowering them so that they can um, create the livelihoods for them. And, and therefore our organizational function is no longer as should be not um, efficiency as such, but equity as well as emancipation and empowering individuals as an ethical organizations that we are we are discussing. And therefore, Makasila Sharia is an important ethical position for us to consider, not in terms of lip service, because that is happening currently, unfortunately, in the Islamic circles, it's very much the lip service rather than embedding into the operation of organization, well-being of all the stakeholders. And it is not to justify the profitability, but it is to ensure that uh, in an embedded manner, the outcomes of the institutions, the organization, the NPOs, whatever we have is an embedded manner aims at um, um, uh, reaching to well-being of all stakeholders. And therefore, this Makasa Sharia can be articulated in different ways, um, but um, essentialization of faith and human rights, self and intellect, posterity and social entity, wealth and environments are certain parts of this policy making that we have to um, utilize around which we can create the um, Islamic, which, uh, through which we can substantiate the Islamic, um, Islamic ethics to, to develop a particular governance understanding. Because what we have around us, as we can see on the left-hand side, most of the people are in the negative. So our objective, therefore, is the empower and em em emancipate and empower this individual. Uh, the equality, of course, doesn't solve your problem, and therefore equity, establishing in the society through the Islamic governance this um, this equilibrium um, in, among people among all the stakeholders. Therefore, on the right hand side, even um, Islamic ethics requires that rather than commodifying whatever we have around us, we have to able um, we have to make sure that people have accessibilities. And therefore, the empowerment and emancipation oriented virtue ethics of Islam aims at providing individuals to have accessibilities uh, rather than preventing them to reach to those um, uh, goods and services that they need to have. And therefore, um, it is very short, I'm rushing, I know, but the sunny governance um, is an important quality that we have to look into um, in terms of establishing equilibrium in the society. Uh, and as, as I mentioned, um, I'm underlying again, yes, regulative environment requires uh, certain, um, certain qualities in relation to the corporate nature of it, but at least in terms of um, internal working, as well as the um, regulative environments are coming uh, more ethical, of course, nowadays, we have to see how we can articulate the Islamic substantive morality in shaping our organization, produce outcomes that fits into the um, uh, Ikhsani governance that I have, um, I have, um, I have labeled it. Um, and with that, of course, um, unfortunately, it's a very um, short period to articulate further, uh, but I'm happy to respond to some questions. Again, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity given. Um, Okay, Jazakallah khair, and uh, thank you very much, and tashakur for that. Yes, uh, I, I think, I think uh, what uh, Professor has actually articulated there for us, uh, I think in terms of the system of accumulation versus the Ihsani uh, governance or Islamic governance, I think this is uh, a very important concept that he's actually articulated. And I think uh, that, that gives us uh, an, an excellent context for ethical governance. Uh, also reminds me that when, you talk, when we talk about uh, the Makasid al-Sharia, then we also need to uh, look at the underlying factors of, of justice, 
and also compassion. So uh, often when we, when we in uh, NGOs and NPOs, uh, when we take a very kind of accumulative and maximization uh, attitude, then we tend to forget about the compassion part of it, the Isani part of it. And I hope that uh, you know, this particular presentation uh, will, will be a, a very important one uh, for us to digest and, and also um, see if we can implement in, in certain ways in, in our uh, non-governmental and non-profit organizations. So I think uh, Jazakallah for that. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions uh, around uh, your topic as well, as well as uh, Muhammad's topic uh, earlier on. And uh, we can move on to Sister Sadia now, uh, who will talk to us uh, also about uh, her experiences in the next few minutes. Jazakallah. Sadia, over to you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The brothers before me have shared some very important messages, alhamdulillah. I was wondering if I could take a little bit of a different stance on this. If you're on this webinar, you've given up some of your time on a Saturday, and you probably already acknowledge the importance of ethics. This may also mean that you are subconsciously agreeing, inshallah, to be an advocate of ethics. Congratulations and welcome. In your journey to be an advocate for ethics, I need to warn you though, you are gonna be met with the, with the following opposition. Ethics is obvious. We are all good people. Why are we wasting time talking about this? And for an Islamic NPO, I imagine it would be, this is an Islamic organization. And all of these may be true, but we are human and we are flawed. Each, and, each of us have different upbringings and different experiences. This shapes how we make decisions, how we deem what is the right thing to do. So how then do we align this with the expectation of an organization? And I think that's what I can share with you. I would like to share with you three steps that will help your organization make ethical decisions. So the first step would be finding a common vocabulary for consistent thinking. Many organizations look to a code of ethics for this purpose. This usually starts with the organizational ethical values. But common vocabulary is not limited to the written word. It is reliant on the conversations and communications in our decision making. A list of great ethics values would include accountability, honesty, integrity. In addition to this, we need to breed life into these words. We need to explain what kind of ex behavior is expected. And this is sometimes done by exploring case studies and decision making before the dilemma is in front of us. So let's take the definition of integrity. Integrity can, is, is often thought to be being honest and having strong moral principles in difficult situations. This is easy to align to. However, how easy would it be to consider integrity in the following situations? The NPO is in dire need of funding. You have recently received interest from a businessman willing to make a large cash donation. However, this individual has been subject to public scrutiny and is currently under investigation. Is this donation acceptable as it serves to further the great work of the organization? Or would this donation's potential effect on the organization's reputation be too great? Or take a scenario that most of us are facing. Your organization has recently been sourcing PPE. Your cousin has also mentioned that he is able to get you his goods at the best price but you're gonna to have to act fast else stock is running out. Do you make the deal with your cousin from fear of losing out on the best price in the interest of your organization? Or do you consider the threats created by a transaction with a family member and follow a more st stringent procurement process? This might result in you losing out on your best price. Step two. Step two is identifying conflicts, your moral dilemmas, and your ethical threats. During job interviews, candidates are often asked about conflicts of interest that they've encountered or ethical threats. The scariest answer, in my opinion, is when they say, I have not encountered a conflict of interest before. Because surely we all have all encountered a conflict of interest or a moral dilemma. Unfortunately, the candidate has not been able to identify the conflict. 
And this may be true for many organizations because without identification of these threats, the conversation on the right course of, of action is missing. Two things that are overlooked with conflicts of interest is, and the first one is that a conflict of interest will exist regardless of the person facing the conflict. When handling funds, there is always a risk of misappropriation. Just because one person is dealing with it compared to another doesn't remove that threat. The next one is that conflict of interest sometimes is a decision between two goods. It's two values that you, that you hold dear and now you need to decide between them. To take, for example, the employee who knows of unethical conduct in, in an organization suspects it. After repeatedly bringing this to a senior management's attention, no action seems to be taken. Does the employee put the onus on integrity and report the situation, that is whistleblow? Or should they respect confidentiality of the organization and continue on bringing change internally? And this brings me to the last step, and this is hopefully the one that has already been touched on, and that is a decision-making matrix. I have displayed a, a diagram that is showing the IESBA code for professional accountants, but you can see from this diagram that it, it can be used for any type of ethical situation. The first one we've spoken about already, and that says identifying the threat. The next one is evaluating the threat. And this is, do we understand the consequences of the actions relating to the threat? Do we, do we have all the facts and circumstances that will allow us to engage with this threat a little bit better? The next step is addressing threats. And this can be done in one of three ways. A, you can eliminate the circumstances creating the threat. So when the transaction related to a family member, are you able to recuse yourself from that decision-making decision process? Is that sufficient in addressing the threat? The next one is applying a safeguard. This may include a, an additional level of approval or um, some consultation and transparency in the process. However, it should be noted that a safeguard is never an explanation. It's some action that is required in order to address it. And the last one is declining or ending the conflict. That is refusal to take place in the situation. So the declining of the donation would be something where you are avoiding the, the ethical threat. And finally, there's, a, there's some need for some reflection. So while you're dealing with this threat, would you be comfortable with the situation being public knowledge? How would this look to someone who is an objective and knowledgeable person outside the organization? And these steps should help with your ethical decision making. I thought I'll leave you in your journey to be in in the next steps of improving ethics with three things. Be alert. Ethics takes place on a day-to-day -day basis. Be an advocate. Remind others of the possibility of threats in order to uh, obtain um, an ethical organization and help them identify these issues. And lastly, increase awareness. One webinar, a few, um, the number of people on this call is not sufficient for the cause. It is every person's responsibility starting a conversation, adding it to your next meeting agenda. Remember that ethics is an investment of time and requires repeated conversation. Jazakala. Jazakala, uh, Sister Sadia. I can see that you, you are real, a, a real champion and a real advocate of ethics. Jazakala for that uh, wonderful presentation and uh, some new insights and ideas there. And, and I'm sure that, uh, you know, people that are listening out there, attendees uh, and organizations will be able to uh, incorporate some of your ideas into their, uh, their, their practices as well, their best practices. I like the idea of, of having um, ethics as a constant reminder to all of us uh, in our agendas and in our organizations. Over to Brother Shabir uh, Chohan. Uh, who I mentioned earlier is the CEO of Al Baraka Bank, but he also serves on various organizations uh, and, and is a member of, a, of, of, as a trustee of various uh, boards as well. So over to you, Brother Shabir. General uh, and you know well done. Some of the experiences that you've had uh, with uh, ethical and unethical conduct in NPOs. Jazakallah. 
Shukran, General. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to all the previous speakers. I think they've articulated extremely well uh, the conduct of an ethical organization or NPOs. Uh, and that's been quite, quite great. Yeah. As you've mentioned, I think the opening comment I want to say is integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. That's a quote by someone. And I think Brother Muhammad raised that uh, in his int introductory uh, speech uh, to talk about doing the, doing the right issue. So I, I served on a number of uh, charitable and educational trust. And my perspective is basically just some practical kind of issues. I do believe for continuity purposes, it's gonna be vital for organizations to implement strong corporate governance. I think that comes as a cornerstone of, of everything that we do. Some of the issues is succession planning. I think if an organization wants to be ethical, they should start looking at succession planning from the beginning. If they do that, they'll start making decisions now that will ensure that there's someone else that's gonna be taking over. And that changes the dynamics quite significantly. A number of organizations I'm involved in, sometimes that's not taken to heart and that creates problems in itself. The second issue is accounting and internal controls. I mean, everyone knows that this must be a top notch. Uh, three of the NPOs that I'm involved in We've appointed an internal auditor, independent internal auditor, getting reports on a regular basis, checking up on controls. And believe me, it is costly, yes, but they add a significant amount of value. And in one case, there was a fraud that was picked up by the internal auditors. Um, if I'm serving on a major uh, NPO, I'm very scared that if something goes wrong, I'll be held responsible as a trustee. So I want another verification process. The completion of audited financial statements within six months of the year end. Uh, I think SANZEF, uh, there might be other organizations also, they very proudly publish those financial statements within time. And for me, that's also contributing to an ethical organization. It's telling me that the controls are strong. They can very quickly go across and produce those financials. Inappropriate processing of transactions. In my experience, not the organization that I'm involved in, but in some of the other organizations I've come across uh, as bankers to these organizations, where you find that the NPO is being used for all kind of illegitimate transactions. Transactions that are contravening the tax rules, transactions that are contravening the FICA rules in the country, where those NPOs are used as a conduit for claiming VAT, for purchasing assets. And I think that's very dangerous. So that's, if it becomes known and if they're exposed, it's not going to be very good for a publicity from a publicity point of view. Then when you come to the trustees, three issues that stand out for me. The one is, I think every NPO must have an independent chairman. Uh, this issue of the, the CEO and the chairman being one, one position doesn't contribute to an ethical organization in my, uh, in my uh, opinion. And I think if organizations have not got an independent chairman, someone that's non-executive also, I should say, uh, they must actually go towards that kind of aspect. The other issue is we do trustees or directors evaluations in companies. Why not do that for the NPOs that we're involved in? Every year, sit back and say, listen, how are the trustees contributing? Are they adding value to the, uh, to the NPO? And believe me, I do believe that uh, uh, you do get people coming and sitting in trust as trustees. They're not even prepared. They don't even read the packs. They're not it's just for the name and fame. But if we go about doing something like this, it will enhance the organization. And finally, on this topic is having formal subcommittees. Very important. I think sometimes there's too much of power, um, either with the chairman or the CEO of the of the trust. And where you have subcommittees with delegated powers, I think you're spreading out the decision-making throughout the organization, among trustees, et cetera. And I found that the way this has come across, it's worked quite significantly for this. Okay, the next slide, please. So something that we have to have a look at is the two or three of the trusts that I'm involved in, they're quite significant and they make significant disbursements. Issues that we've implemented is number one, where beneficiaries or companies are making an application for funding, we're insisting on the latest financial statements. And when I say latest, it mustn't be older than one year. 
So at this point in time, if the financials are older than February 2019, we won't even consider those applications. If we're doing it in our other business areas, why not do it for trust? In one instance, when the financial statements came in, we picked up that the, the, the entity actually went and falsified the auditor's report. And because we've got some very sharp people sitting on the trust boards, they picked that up, phoned the company, phoned the auditors and said, listen, that's not the true reflection of it. The second issue is um, if we're making big payments, we actually get those projects independently verified at the end of the projects before making any disbursements. So I think in one trust that I'm involved in, any contributions over 100,000, we'll send a qualified quantity surveyor to go across to have a look at those projects, to come back, indicate that he's given us a certificate, and then only we release those payments. You can't believe how much of uh, impropriety we picked up because of this step that we've taken. If we're giving the funds, we need to make sure that we're running an ethical organization, and therefore the disbursement that we're making must be addressed in a very transparent manner. The third is payments must go directly to the suppliers. And as Zainul mentioned, I'm giving you some practical issues on what we operating on the trustees that I'm involved in, on the trust that I'm involved in. So we never make payments to uh, the beneficiaries themselves. It will go to the suppliers. But in the process, we also go across and verify the suppliers. Just a couple of weeks ago, there's a payment that came to me. And as I was going through the documentation for making the payment, something looked a bit strange in terms of the, the contractor. And when you go deeper, it kind of picked up that uh, the contractor had the same address as uh, one of the main trustees on the board. And you go and dig deeper, we have access to the information and it's actually the person's wife. And I think the information that Muhammad raised earlier in terms of the fraud that's committed by trustees, for me, that was a staggering figure. I never realized that was so high, but that's, I'm giving you an example of something that I've picked up. And the last issue from my side is basically doing post-implementation reviews. So if you are involved in NPOs, you should have a process of actually making sure even after six months, after one year, after two years, to go across and check up that the funds that you've actually dispersed have been used for the right purpose. In one instance, we actually picked up a half a million rand funding that we provided for a certain uh, disbursement it wasn't used for that. Currently, we're also investigating another payment that was made. So the people will tell you they're gonna use it for X purposes or Y purposes. But when you go and do a post-implementation review, you find another uh, kind of set of circumstances. So I think, I think all these kind of issues, in my view, are some of the practical aspects that will contribute to organizations continuing and playing the role. This is the next slide, this is my last slide. I think in South Africa, I know that NPOs are playing an extremely vital role. If you just have a look at um, the, the, the COVID and the food parcels and the charity that's given and the profit-free loans that is given, that's another trust that I'm involved in, they playing a major role. We must make sure that we have a responsibility for strengthening these NPOs for the future survival of these NPOs and also for contributing to a society. I think Zainal, in the very limited time I've had, I tried to cover that very quickly and thank you very much and we'll probably take questions later. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jazakallah Khair, uh, Brother Shabir. Once again, I think a very important uh, practical examples and I think from your personal experience, you've highlighted some of the shortfalls that, that we experience in, in our NGOs. And uh, it's, it's really sad to say that if you have picked up certain fraudulent activities, I think um, it really means that we, we have to be very, very uh, careful uh, about. And, and the uh, suggestions that you've made, I think, uh, well, I, think, I think some of them are expensive. I think to create an ethical organization from some of the steps that you suggested uh, would, be, would be a costly affair, uh, depending on the size of the organization and the size of uh, disbursements that, have, that they are making. But at the end of the day, I think uh, it may be well worth the trouble and well worth the money that we spend. 
Okay, so look, we've, we've only got about 20 minutes left for uh, a Q&A session, but I think to kick off, um, one of the questions that have come, come is that, um, what about an NPO that refuses to inform its members how donations are spent? Like, basically, we're not informing donors about our, our expenditure and, and where their funds have been spent. Uh, Mohammed, would you like to attend to that one? Jazakallah, uh, Zainul. I think, you, you know, we touched on the issue of transparency in my presentation, and this goes to that very point, uh, transparency, but it also goes to the point that uh, Sister Sadia raised around accountability. If an entity, uh, NPO, is not willing to share information around what they're actually doing with the funds that they're collecting, then that goes to a very serious breach in accountability. And donors need to become very, very more, uh, much more vigilant today than we've been in the past. With respect, uh, not every organization is actually executing on its mandate. Uh, regularly, we hear of organizations uh, that have actually gone to the public, collected monies and disappeared without actually spending a cent uh, on, on their mandate or on what they purported to be their mandate. So I think the donors need to come to the party as well in the sense that uh, they need to become more vigilant. They need to start asking the right questions and not just uh, distributing funds and, you know, to uh, where they think they're executing their responsibility by giving away money. Um, you really can't do much if an organization is not actually being uh, uh, transparent, except for the fact that, uh, you know, you can expose them or you can actually ask the donors to, to withhold funding. Should, we have, my, my should we have some kind of oversight organization uh, for, uh, you know, uh, it reminds me of the, and maybe uh, Professor Mahmoud uh, Asute could, uh, could tell us about this. Uh, in, in, in the Prophet's example, there was the Muhtasib, who was really the market regulator and who, who, who was the public uh, ombudsman, so to say. And for Islamic organizations, should we perhaps have something like that? I think uh, with the new, I mean, we are doing a research on looking at the Hispa institution as a potential institution to look into how um, in particular, Islamic institution could benefit uh, from the example that you have provided, because when we look at Hispa, um, it, it it was um, it is again an authentic um, um, Islamic institution. Um, it was mainly theoretically developed by Ibn Taymiyyah, um, but of course the experience goes back um, to the uh, experience of the Prophet Sallallahu um, The whole idea is to develop such institutional forms, whether we are talking NPOs, um, commercial organizations, or um, banks and financial institutions, uh, to look into how a body, and this body is not a Sharia board I'm looking, I'm, I'm referring to, because such as in the Islamic banks, you have Sharia boards, but they have not been able to deliver the substantive morality we are looking at. And therefore, um, uh, such institution, the revitalization of the Hispa institution in the institutional level, as well as within the societies, is an essential part um, to look into how the substantive morality can be essentialized in the running of organizations. Um, and therefore, um, uh, because under the current circumstances, yes, regulative environment provides us um, certain code, codes of conduct. However, um, again, as quite a number of examples have been provided, uh, we won't be able to uh, overcome the problems created. And therefore, how we can make the virtue ethics as a substantive part of the individual, and not only organization, but individuals. And that requires certain, um, certain policy making at the institutional level, as well as in macro level. In macro level, perhaps it's difficult because as one of the questions refers, there's a secular environment and each one of us has particular ethical base. However, in the organizations, in particular um, Islamic organizations, for instance, Zakat organization, Waqf, um, as well as other charitable organizations, it is essential that um, such a check and control mechanisms have to develop to essentialize that the virtue ethics um, is in play and determines individual behavior 
as well as the organizational behavior is ex um, uh, producing the outcomes that we expect. Um, and therefore, as I mentioned, uh, regulative environment requires a certain, um, certain codes of ethics, but how uh, in a civil society um, and within our organization, we can develop different layers, such as in the case of Islamic banks, uh, despite the market environment and which is not a requirement of the market, but we have developed Sharia boards to ensure that the transactions are, fulfills the FUQ condition, the conditions of the Islamic law. In a similar manner, we have to look into the morals and the ethicality, how it can be articulated similar, another layer, another layer has to be um, considered in our governance mechanism um, so that this, what I call the Ihsani governance can be essentialized. Um, and therefore, despite the secular environment, such as in South Africa, you have an Islamic bank and which has a Sharia board. But the South African uh, governance um, codes would not require you to have a Sharia board, but because of the particularities of being an Islamic bank, in order to ensure that the transactions are Sharia compliant, you have another layer in the corporate governance. In a similar manner, my position has been, we should look into not only transactional um, understanding of the um, um, understanding of the compliance, but in terms of moral, um, and as well as the larger ethical questions, uh, we, we should consider bringing another layer um, so that the outcomes that we expect fulfills the expectations. Okay, Thank you. so I think uh, maybe sometime in the future, uh, we could talk about uh, the Hizba institution. I think it's a very important institution that was created. And as you rightly pointed out, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, spoke about it in his uh, uh, book, Public Duties in Islam. Uh, and I hope that maybe perhaps uh, that, is, that is one of the institutions that we could Certainly. perhaps implement in, in the future. And we look forward to your uh, research on it as well. So. Um, one of the questions that, that uh, keeps coming up is uh, our levels of expenditure in, um, in Islamic NPOs. Uh, for example, we, 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 we've come across uh, instances where uh, expenses, the expense ratio to, to revenues is perhaps as high as 35, 40% uh, of, of, of donations that come in. What should be a reasonable expense ratio? I, I don't know uh, who to uh, refer that question to, but I think Shabir, you can perhaps look at that one from your practical experience. So, you know, thank you. I think it's a very difficult question. It depends on the circumstances, right? But I think um, in, in, in determining an expense ratio, the one issue is to be transparent about it uh, to the donors. So if someone tells you uh, they kind of contributing to you, 30-40% uh, is an extremely high amount. So some of the charities that I'm involved in, we've kept uh, the expenses quite low but that's because I've got the luxury of using the institution I'm involved in to use some of the services and everything else. So in that way, it works out. But where organizations are going across and buying head offices and uh, creating structures, and it's unfortunately becoming a money-making scheme to a certain extent. There's ego sometimes, there's money-making schemes in terms of just one trying to outdo the other, but who loses out is the community. Now, I think, it's going to be very difficult to tell you whether it's 10%. In some organizations that I'm involved in, it's 10%. Some of them are 15%. But I know, I think that was covered at one of your sessions or one of the other sessions I've attended, where there was a percentage that was given. But as I said, it's going to be very difficult to indicate a percentage, not knowing the circumstances of the organization, what they're involved in, what's objectives. Is it more technology driven? Is it more staff driven, et cetera, in terms of, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jazakallah. Um, okay, I know that some organizations um, kept their um, expense ratios to about 12.5%, uh, but there could be others that, that are, you know, much higher, as, as we pointed out. So, um, one of the questions, it's an ethical question, especially during this COVID period, um, is it ethical behavior to use COVID-19 as, uh, as, a, as a reason to retrench staff? 
under a false threat, stating that they have a financial crisis. Uh, Sadia, what do you think about that? Well, all ethics decisions depends on the facts and circumstances, and this is very important. Um, depending on whether the, the statement is made factually, whether they actually are alerting staff, um, any false threats wouldn't be viewed because you aren't, you aren't up, upholding honesty and integrity, even in your communication with, with staff. So I think that it's, uh, even though you're making decisions internally, it also needs to uphold the same type of ethics everyone would expect for when you see, you pub, when you see an entity being pub, public, publicly displayed. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, uh, if, if I, I could respond, yeah. could I? Yes, uh, I think, a, again, it goes back to how we perceive our organization and how we have shaped it. Within the accumulationist understanding, which shapes, unfortunately, um, our political economies, um, then um, it becomes very much the uh, labor becomes uh, a commodity as well, a commodity that you only use. You, you refer to the use value rather than the inherent value of an, being a an human. So unfortunately, the political economy that we have around us is forcing to make such decisions. But on the other hand, um, we have to look into how, therefore, uh, challenge such political economies rather than go with them and see uh, what resources we have in our hand and therefore respond uh, rather than go with the win and, um, and, and carry on with the, uh, with the unfortunately, the, um, the political economy positions that we have around us. And that is my position perhaps as uh, the difference between substantive morality and the in um, instrumental morality, because even without COVID, and we have seen in the city where I live, where there are large uh, number of Muslims in Leicester in the UK, uh, we see how Muslims and the immigrant communities have been unfortunately exploited by Muslim uh, business people. And then these um, brothers and sisters as a business individuals, they are very generous. Then they go and contribute to the construction of a mosque or a charity. And therefore I was referring to the distinction between substantive morality and the, um, and the instrumental morality, because charity then becomes an instrumental morality. However, however ch the substantive morality requires that your first responsibility for the people that you are, um, um, the people mm -hmm. who are working for you. And therefore with this COVID environment as well, uh, similar attitudes because our organizations unfortunately shape according to efficiency rather than looking at the welfare, welfare of the stakeholders. And therefore, a, a mindset has to change. Of course, there's a global issue and global imposition. But on the other end, at least those people who consider themselves ethical and, and as religious, they have to look into how they should not go with the wind of the neoliberal economies, how they could shape. Because if you are I'm not giving the right of the people working for you and then giving the charity, that doesn't make sense, unfortunately. And, and that it is entirely instrumentalization of the Islamic ethic. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jazakallah for that. Um, one of the sisters is asking, uh, what support is available uh, for new and existing NPOs and to board members uh, so that they may become more aware of ethical codes and corporate governance codes. And, and I think uh, uh, just another question to that would be, uh, if, if, if there's any uh, misdemeanor in any NPO, who do they actually report it to? And Mohammed, can you perhaps elaborate on that? So I think there's two things. First is that, um, you know, there is a, a process underway uh, to actually develop uh, a code for NPOs, uh, and inshallah, that process is uh, quite uh, has progressed quite well. Uh, Brother Suleiman Badat, who's on the uh, webinar, will probably touch on that. And there are plans afoot in terms of to different NPOs through a process of training, etc. With regards to, um, I think the second question was around who do you report matters mm -hmm. to. I think one of the challenges we have uh, as uh, Muslim organizations, and I say this uh, with respect, is that when people are involved in money laundering, in theft, in fraud, 
we have a tendency of not wanting to report it uh, criminally. Now, um, you know, I had an instance where uh, I was uh, giving a talk to a particular NPO a while ago, and this was erased. And, um, you know, the, the individuals around the table said, well, we're not really like the corporate world because, you know, at Zor time, we're going to meet uh, so-and-so uh, if we go and uh, do X, Y, and Z. My question was, um, I wanted to know how you were going to face Allah on the Day of Judgment knowing that your funds were stolen and you did nothing about it. And I think that as uh, NPOs, Muslim NPOs, we need to start taking very strong lines on this. Uh, because what the other thing that you find is that a, a fraudster leaves one organization and then joins another one. Because there's no disciplinary hearing. We haven't followed the due process of terminating his employment correctly. And therefore, we find it difficult to say that he's a thief. I, I'm sorry, I say it as it is because uh, ethics is driven by action, not by language. It's not driven by talk, it's driven by action. And that is something that is lacking in, in Muslim organizations, not just locally, I think globally. Uh, we find that we, we tend to sweep too much under the carpet. It's gonna come back to haunt us one day. So the first step is that if there is a, an outright uh, process breach or a fraud, fraudulent issue, it has to be reported to the board of trustees they are accountable to act. What action that may require is going to be deemed by the severity of the uh, charge. The first is that if he's a volunteer, paid volunteer, there must be a process of disciplinary. That person will be given a chance to present themselves and a decision will be taken. And if the person is found guilty of fraud, then there must be criminal charges laid because again, these are public funds. How are we going to answer to donors when monies have been missing? Now, we, we've, we've experienced this a lot, where in some cases you've seen money disappear. But it's donors' money at the end of the day that has disappeared. And that donor, and in the case of Zakar, Professor was touching on it, Professor Mehmet touched on it earlier on. You know, the issue of Zakar is, is quite uh, guided and directed in terms of Quran. Uh, if, if that money is gone missing, there's a question of whether the donor's Zakar has been uh, ada, yes or no. I mean, uh, so it can get very difficult, and we need, as as NPO leaders, we need to make sure that we hold accountable our the people that volunteer in organization and. Okay, you breaking up there? I think you've frozen there. Uh, you just froze for a while, uh, Mohammed. Okay, Jazakallah. I think ju just one, one final thing. Uh, people have been asking also about the use of technology, for example, blockchain, to, to help develop uh, more transparency and, and more ethical conduct. Do you think that uh, maybe Sadia you and, and Shabir, you could uh, kind of uh, uh, give your inputs on this? Um, do you think that we could use technology to enhance this, the ethical conduct and transparency of organizations? Blockchain, for example. I think Sadia first. Technology is something that is in our environment. We're going to have to consider how ethics works in it. However, the, the, thing, the thing I'd, I'd like, like, like to introduce is that there's also a bias that comes with technology. Just because using technology doesn't mean that it will be more ethical or transparent. It's actually something that needs to be understood because the circumstances and the um, specialism that comes with it needs to be fully understood for it for in, in order to get the benefit out of the product. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if you have anything else to add, Shabir. Say so, no, sorry, I just want to go back to something else though we spoke about uh, if there's fraud taking place. And I never mentioned this because we haven't actually introduced it to our NPOs, uh, but I know a number of us got toll free hotlines, kind of fraud lines. I think the organization that I'm involved in, Amal and maybe some of the other organizations, Okaf, I think we must go and try to introduce a toll free hotline, some ethical line where people go across and they can start exposing the fraud that's taking place. I think if we do that, 
uh, we'll be contributing quite significantly to ethical NPOs in the country. And I think just it gave me an idea while I was kind of listening to this, and I think I'm going to take the lead as far as this is concerned. The funding is another issue as to how we do it. But if we do that and we go out and say, listen, if you're aware of something that's incorrect, that's wrong, please come across here. We'll have the confidentiality issues and everything else in it. But imagine what that will do to governance. And that's going to be something that I think we must take on as far as that is concerned. The other issue is, I think, uh, in the limited time out here, someone asked about training. I know Amal had a training on NPOs and PVOs, and we had people from the department coming across and from the Department of Social Development. And maybe that must be uh, an annual issue that goes across. But as Mohammed has mentioned, there is something coming up quite soon. I'm also involved in that initiative with, uh, with Suleiman Badat, and perhaps that's gonna be a bigger rollout in the next one month in terms of how people can get training uh, on running ethical uh, NPOs and PBOs. Thank you. Okay, I see there is, uh, just, I just wanna make this comment uh, from one of the sisters that it would be a great, uh, it would be great if we had an organization to oversee all Muslim registered and non-registered charity organizations. So it also goes uh, towards that uh, Hizba institution and also this toll free number that you're talking about, uh, Shabira. I think uh, it seems that there is that kind of uh, feeling within the community that we need some uh, form of uh, accountability at another level uh, well, for, for, for something like you have the financial services board or uh, you know, an organization that can oversee um, what NGOs are doing and their reporting and so forth, that they can report back to the public, the donor public. I think uh, we, we have come to the end of the program, but, but before we do that, we'll ask uh, Brother Suleiman Badat to give us some of his remarks and closing comments. He's been really uh, one of the champions of the corporate governance uh, pro project. And uh, we'd like him to just talk about uh, the way forward and what, what, what's the next steps here. Jazakallah, Brother Zainal, for that. Uh, I will keep it short and sharp. Uh, just to share with you the results of one of the polls, uh, and the question was, does your organization have a code of ethics? 50% of the, of the respondents said yes, and 50% of the respondents said no. So I think the poll, the poll results, as well as the nature of the questions, uh, certainly confirm that the monitoring and the enforcement of ethical behavior is, is indeed a, a challenge uh, being faced by many of our NPOs. So inshallah, uh, the next steps from this webinar, firstly, is to publish a, a guidance paper that will provide some practical tips and suggestions on how NPOs can improve ethical behavior within the respective organizations. And then to also develop a, a best practice ethical code for Islamic NPOs, which, uh, which NPOs can tailor to suit the particular circumstances. And an ethics training program will be, will be considered inshallah. And let me also take this opportunity to say that the governance code for Islamic NPOs that has been referred to uh, by a few speakers, inshallah, is, is at a very advanced stage of development. And, uh, and we're expecting that to be launched uh, certainly before the end of this calendar year, inshallah. And finally, uh, please watch the space for the next webinar in this governance series. And that will take place in October and, and will deal with succession planning, which is also a very relevant and topical uh, subject in the Islamic NPO space. Uh, Jazakallah for that, uh, Zainal, let me hand back to you. Okay, Jazakallah. Uh, maybe just one more point there that uh, we have uh, talked to some brothers at the International Islamic University in Malaysia, uh, a professor, Sharif there, uh, who is going to be assisting us. Uh, he is, in, he is uh, a professor of business ethics, actually, and uh, he's agreed to form a team together with our team here uh, to, to start uh, developing a code of conduct, a code of ethics, actually. Uh, so we hope that, uh, you know, that, that will also be part of the process of this particular initiative, inshallah. 
So with that, uh, I'd like to say, say thanks uh, once again, thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us uh, this opportunity to, to talk to this, uh, to talk to uh, improving Islamic NGOs in particular. And, and, and I hope that uh, you know, the messages that we have will also filter through to other NGOs as well, because a lot of the principles that we talk about are common to, to all. So uh, thanks a lot to all the speakers, the panelists there, uh, and also uh, our technical team at the back who's been helping us uh, putting this whole webinar together. Uh, Jazakallah khairan, and we'll close off. Uh, I, I don't know if there's any other uh, alim there, but I think I will take the opportunity and, and say, uh, you know, read a, 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 a verse from the Quran that we normally close off with. Audhu billahi minash shaitani rajeem, bismillahi rahmani rahim. والأسر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر جزاك الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. السلام عليكم everyone thank you thank you thank you and thanks to all the participants who so faithfully attended uh, this set of webinar جزاك الله خيرا السلام عليكم. عليكم السلام. Sanzaf, changing lives through development and relief. I act to make an impact. When we take care of each other, wonderful things happen. Children thrive, the elderly rejoice, communities celebrate. Awqaf South Africa, a charitable waqaf receiving organization makes it easy to share the care. All donations are plowed into Sharia compliant investments, while the fruits support a great variety of charitable causes. Visit the Awqaf South Africa website at awqafsa.org.za to discover how your waqaf can bless our community with the legacy of care. Awqaf South Africa, share the care.